بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء المرسلين الحمد لله نحن في ماليزيا مع الدكتور محمد هاشم كمالي وأصركم من أفغانستان وأنت الآن أستاذ في الإسلامك إنستيتوت of Malaysia في أصول الفقه You have I think 13 books now and your book on أصول الفقه in my estimation, it's really the best uh, textbook that's been written as an introduction into usul al-fiqh. One of the things that, certainly in the West, and, and the, the West is important in that it has immense influence now in the world, and one of the issues that they often uh, take umbrage with concerning Islam is, is the gender inequity. I mean, that's actually a term that they would use. I've always believed that Islam stands for equality and justice and also human dignity. I think that um, these um, complement one another. Uh, if one talks about justice, of course gender justice must be included. We have a clear text in the Quran, Raqat Karamna Bani Adama. We have granted dignity to the children of Adam. And of course, male and female are included. Islam's commitment to fair treatment, to justice, and these values uh, are basically, the Quran does not speak of gender. Area of family relations, I think that uh, the basic principles of Sharia would give you uh, or of the Qur'an in Sunnah would give you a vision of equality that is uh, slightly different to what we read in the books of Fiqh. The, the scholastic jurisprudence has been, I think, uh, heavily influenced by the patriarchal customs, medieval custom, and maybe the Arab culture. Uh, and uh, we have seen that uh, the initial openness that we have uh, in the sources have been translated and justified through time and um, we have for example in the Shafi Mazhab they would tell you that the diya, the blood money of a woman is half of that of man but the Hanafis would stand by a nafs of nafs right. the Quran say life for life and there is no basis for this kind of uh, discrimination. Uh, maybe there are some uh, levels of uh, distinctions that uh, we have in Islamic law and jurisprudence in the area, for example, of uh, inheritance. Women take uh, half the share of that of man. But Inheritance is a very finely balanced structure and you don't need to know the context. And the context is such that the share within the family, some uh, influence the other. But there is also in the juristic discourse some justification for that is that a man is always take care of the, of the nafaka, uh, supporting women in the family, whether it is the wife or the daughter previous prior to marriage. Uh, and there are certain other things like mm, uh, dower or maybe other, uh, that, that this to some extent balance out. Should there be a case, and I wrote in my book, uh, Equity and Fairness in Islam, where there is obvious situation of inequality, I have seen uh, a, a woman here in Malaysia telling me that uh, her brother never care, took care of the family or the father. The father passed away and she was the one always standing by him. And now he claims double the share of the sister. In such situations, I think maybe bequest can be used as a way of moderating this, um, you know, sometimes situation of unfair distribution. Up to one-third is permitted if someone feels that this is while you are alive, uh, you can perhaps adjust that. 
Nowadays, the realities have changed. The realities are such that the women are also participants in the right. provision. If a woman is a professional person, they bring, uh, you know, income to the family. Yes. And I have read in Ibn Hazm's writing and that uh, this nafaqa supporting the wife is always an obligation of the husband regardless of the, the wealth of the situation wife. of the wealth of the wife. But he then uh, quotes the mazahib and says that they are all uh, somewhat mistaken. And he says that the Quran describes marriage mawadda wa rahma, that is friendship in, in compassion. Supposing that the husband is in need, he is ill or he cannot earn, and the wife is affluent, should it not also be the obligation of the wife to support the husband? Mm. And I think that it is a perfectly reasonable suggestion in line with the vision that you have in the Quran. We are at the threshold of perhaps uh, an inevitable movement. Islam accepts the fact that uh, the, the ahkam change with the change of realities and conditions. There is a legal maxim that a fatwa in a hukum change with the change Al of time. Al -hukum no. Do you mean no. in no. reference Other also to women, especially specifically? I mean, if we're considering women with this change, and there's so much change yes. with women in the Muslim world, what do you think are the uh, main rights or laws that you think should be? expanding. In Morocco they have introduced a lot of changes in the area of marriage and divorce. And one thing that this idea of, uh, of wilaya or guardianship has been revised. Man and woman are now more or less seen as equal partners. The kind of, you know, interpretations that we had, that a woman is in all situations committed to obey the husband and whatever he says. This is now, and there is a certain healthy adjustment in that. Because the Quran tells us that you must make decisions through consultation, even within the family. Uh, part of the problem is the word ta'a, which, which most Arabs understand to mean this kind of uh, obsequiousness, right. that, that it's, it's, a, it's an absolute obedience where there's no... It, it, the root word, the, the, the Arabs say like Raghab Isbahani and, and others, that it's lana. Is, it's really from a type of tractability. It's that people aren't obstinate yes. in, their, in their nature. Exactly. And the Prophet Wasallam said that Al-Mu'minu hayyinun layyinun idha qeedan qad that the, the believer by nature is, is easy going, that if, if you lead him one way, he'll go that way. There is the kind of rigidity you see in the scholastic jurisprudence right. that has set in. But when you look at the sources, this is not, there, there it's is not a lot of the reciprocity yes. and the kind of, you know, um, the Quranic description of uh, uh, marriage in so many places. There is mawadda and rahma, and there is the fair treatment of one another. These would open um, having, naam, the idea of ta'a you earlier. In the Quran, there is this immediately uh, you, there is ta'a, there is obedience, but if you have a dispute, because, bring it up yeah. in discussion. So this is it, if you have a dispute, you have to have something strong to go back to. There is an aspect of the fiqh jurisprudence that permits child marriage, for example. But now through the uh, determination of a marriageable age, we have actually adjusted that situation in um, under the present law, all marriages are supposed to be by adult partners. We also have moved from the fiqh position in regards to divorce. It is now for the court of justice. And a, a divorce outside the court of law is not recognized. So this is another adjustment from uh, earlier position to a position that Oh, we are moving toward the idea of equality. What if you have a state 
uh, or a country like the United States in the West where they're accepting a lot of adjustments and it's going the opposite extreme. When do you draw that line and say this is too much going into Islam? I think uh, uh, the Quran has given us the guideline وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا We ought to not move not to the one extreme nor to the other. Uh, and find our bearing what is wasatiyah, what is to be in the middle position. Is wasatiyah consists of justice, moderation, and the values combined together. The leaders, the ulul amr, and their judgment about what they consider to be realistic and fair, they have a say in it. Uh, but this is also the ulul amr, the legitimate leaders of the community. They have uh, the authority to determine uh, what is uh, the perception of equality. Of course, this does not. This could not be arbitrary. Well, even even the definition ulul amri. I mean, you know that for the first three centuries, it was just generally understood to be the ulama, and then. Later, they will al umara will ulama put put them together. Ahlul Halli wal Aqad, the people of uh, of unbinding and binding, the people that were able to analyze problems, look at them. Part of the problem, though, is where are they? The ulul amr today are the elected assembly, the head of state, the prime minister, ministers, and the parliament. These are the ulul amr of our times. So if you put it to the ulama in the umara you know it's difficult now. Most of the constitutions and laws, uh, especially constitutional law, they did not claim an, uh, their origin from the Islamic tradition. And they, the Muslim masses did not really identify themselves closely with them, and the leaders were also, you know, not from uh, in, among them. There's a social science theory called congruence theory. At its most fundamental uh, principle, it states that, that a, a, a government is only effective to the degree with which the governing principles are replicated throughout the other social institutions yes. of the society. So how do you change, how do you go from, uh, from, from, from very despotic environments to a democracy when you when you don't have any of the social institutions that are going to support this that is, what is I was... why I'm saying that it's not really enough to introduce a piece of legislation you have to educate to work to hold seminars and go to the villages and meet the people and, and generate discussion and this is the way that... you know I agree with you but on the other hand for me what I see in the Muslim world is an in, you know total lack of training. We don't have jurists that are at the levels that can do these this type of this type of work is really serious, uh, rigorous intellectual and spiritual work. Indeed, be, because people have to be, you know, just in such a spiritual state to be able to 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 navigate these waters. My response to this is that this is part of the rem, the remnants of taqlid. We are being told that the mujtahids are extinct that we do not have qualified people. And that uh, Al-Ghazali, he himself wrote in Al-Mustasfa, in our time, Mujtahid is extinct. And later, Al-Shawkani, centuries later, says, did he forget himself? He was one. We do have... I believe that, yeah, but it's, it's, there are not many, and then the opportunities... Not many, but I, I feel that in the Quran, you have al-kitab wal-hikmah. You know, there's not that life is not such a thing that you are live your everyday life by the rule and by the text. It's the wisdom and leadership. And I think that the human touch does things that no text can do. What were the main laws that you felt for women needed reinforcement and they were necessary to kind of make things right? A lot of the problems that the women of Afghanistan face, they are related to these oppressive patriarchal tribal customs that recognize very little. Even the laws of inheritance that are Quranic, women are not given the right of their share in inheritance. There is forced marriage, child marriage, marriage has become a commercial deal. I hear 
that because of the proactive action we have in the Constitution, we, uh, we had a, root, uh, a quota system that there must be two women representatives from every province to sit in Parliament. You know, the reforms uh, that, that need to be done, if they're going to be implemented, need to be realistic. About the affirmative action concerning women, I admit there is superficiality in that, but without it, you will not see anything that would be near the sort of, you know, participatory government or parliament that is representative of, of half of Afghanistan. The one 27-year-old woman, and I was reading about her, uh, Malala Joya. She was a, a refugee in, in Pakistan and then Iran, and she comes in member of parliament. And uh, she is very active. She speaks for the rights of women, for good values. And one thing that uh, she also said is that a lot of the people in parliament sitting are warlords and their hands are stained with, you know, she raised an uproar in parliament. But she's courageous. She says that, I know that she's been threatened, you know, for her life. When these women are alienated and, and um and attacked and aggressed upon. I mean, to me, w one of the results that I find very frightening is that more and more women will begin to see Islam as being this oppressive system that really doesn't want the women to, to get their fair place in society. But this in is, society. I think, Sheikh Hamza, and Malaysia kind of is a very good example to face that kind of um, accusation because, I mean, since we arrived last night in the airport, Muslim women with their hijab are all over the airport, I mean, even in the toll when we were paying. I mean, what do you think helped them so much to become in the public eye like that with their identity so strong? I think that the Malay, uh, because of the challenges, the multi-religious com composition of Malaysia, 30% Chinese, 12% Indians, Muslims about 50 are over 50%. This, the reality of pluralism itself has made, uh, faced the Muslim here with a challenge to have their identity. And the Malay really by definition is a person, uh, a Muslim, who knows the language in the adat of Malaysia, the Muslim the community. So they are, they see themselves as really, um, you know, Islam is a part of their living yes, tradition. Yes, it's very clear. It, it, that is, I think, a strong feature of their. The other is that uh, there has been, a, a, you know, cons a consistent pattern of bringing moderate reforms over a period of many, many decades, for example. And the third factor is that the version by history, Islam here has come in a different way. Through trade. Through mm -hmm. Sufis and trade and this. It's a gentle Islam. It's a gentle Islam. You no, know, historically, uh, the Malay culture is a matriarchal culture. Yes. Uh, even before Islam. Uh, and, and in fact, one of their foundational myths is about the, the Malay princess. Who? Yeah, the matrilineal line in Suramban, just about an hour away from Kuala Lumpur, uh, is the woman who is really the, the main, the principal link. Yeah. But in Malaysia, we have seen it in reality, that uh, in schooling in the villages, the universities, generally the female population is in the majority. And in classes, their results are much better to the extent that it becomes a little embarrassing. Education is the key to improvement, whatever you are talking about. And we are talking about public issues of public concern. Mm -hmm. Unless you have enlightened the people, the understanding of your challenges, you are really, you are hampered. We want to really thank you for um, giving us this time. And uh, I you know, like I said, I, I benefited from your books. I think they're wonderful contributions to the increasing Islamic literature in, in the West, in English. And, uh, and I really hope that you have increased tawfiq. And uh, I know you've done an immense amount of work in Afghanistan. We all pray for that country, your country. 
to come into a brighter future. So, Jazakallah khairan. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you very much. Pleasure to meet thank with you. you.